All right. Well, good morning, everybody. How are we doing? So my name is Chris Pleckenpole. I'm one of the pastors here at Wells Branch Community Church. And if you're just joining us, like this is your first time like ever, welcome. We are so pumped that you joined us this morning. And if you've been here like forever, awesome that you're here. We're right in the middle of a series called Margin. And uh, Margin is, let me just give you a quick definition. It's the distance or the space between your load and your limit. And uh, do I have any like, military people around here that like carried large rucksacks? When I say rucksacks, you actually know what that is? Okay, good. All right, so when I was um, at ranger school uh, back in the olden days, we carried this monstrous rucksack. And I could do, you know, 85 pounds was, was doable. But one particular day, you know, you're doing 12 miles uh, through the sand of Florida, and it's brutal. And uh, I think I, I put in a whole bunch of extra ammo because I wanted to be hard. There's two types of rangers, by the way, strong ranger, smart ranger. I made way better smart ranger than a strong ranger. Anyway, so uh, one particular day, we're walking through the sands of Florida, and I'm like dying. And we, we took a short halt, which just means you stop for a second. And uh, I'm like, guys, I can't take another step. And we opened up my, my ruck, and I had so much ammo, ammunition. They're like, what are you carrying all this for? And I'm like, I don't know. I was beyond my limit. My load was beyond my limit. And uh, what that does is it makes you actually a burden or a, uh, a uh, something that people kind of have to help out or kind of do more for as opposed to uh, someone that you can take someone's load off them. And so what I learned is you cannot go beyond your limit. And it's not just with like carrying actual weight in the military, but it comes with our time. Like for a lot of us, we live frazzled lives, right? And uh, we're so overextended when it comes to uh, our time with God or with our family, uh, we kind of put that on the back burner because we got work to do. And like, Who's got time to do all that? And then also with our finances, for a lot of us, we're living paycheck to paycheck. I mean, essentially, if there was an emergency that came up, the car breaks down, uh, you know, the water heater goes out, AC goes down, and especially in the summer, that's bad. If that happens, we're stuck. And we don't know, without going into debt even further, we couldn't pay that off. And so what we want to do with this series, and we're right in the middle of it, was allow us to understand how to live with not just at our limits or beyond, but within a place where we can um, have space, where we can serve God with our time, with our talent, and our treasure in a way that's going to be honoring to Him and have space that it's going to be something that's going to be a blessing. So that's sort of where we went. And um, last week, uh, or the week before, we were talking about... um, we, we, actually, a week before that, we, we've been talking about money, and we've got 255 people uh, of this church that are involved in Financial Peace University. That's sort of a big deal, 255. Um, <clears throat> and so what we found is we've got about a million and a half dollars in debt from all that, and about a million plus in like liquid cash, which is sort of bizarre, right? We've got people here, which is why I love our church. We've got people here that are doing really, really well financially. And we got a lot of people here that aren't. And if you put us all together, we can learn from one another, right? And we're going to teach one another how to honor God with our finances. And my heart and my hope is that we would get people that are struggling financially out of debt in a place where they could be a blessing to uh, God and others. But then the last two weeks, um, and of course that always makes people nervous when I talk about money. And then, but the last couple of weeks we would talk about our time. And as a pastor, people in general are like, okay, like you're not sitting getting offended or like angry at me uh, and writing nasty emails when I talk about your time with God, right? Like in general, you're like, all right, you're a pastor, you know, you should be talking about God. And, you know, I felt guilty, but, you know, that's an okay guilt because I need to spend more time with God, right? And my heart is you would never feel guilty when you come here, but rather sometimes we confuse conviction with guilt. I'm like, I just feel so something. I can't understand it. That's conviction, not guilt. We don't do guilt here. We do conviction. The, the rest of the world, the rest of your day is give you enough guilt as it is. All right. So we don't want to have any drive-by guiltings. But for the most part, you're okay when I talk about your time with God because, man, that's what we're at church. 
Okay? And then you're pretty, pretty, everyone's pretty much okay when I say, get your face out of your phone and stare at your kid, right? When we talk about your time with your family, for the most part, people are okay with me saying that. And they go, and I say, like, the reason why your kid has his face stuck in their phone is because you have your face stuck in your phone and they're only doing what they learned. But that's another sermon for last week. Okay. So what I wanted you to see is that we have this capacity in, in our margin of time to kind of judge other people and kind of, especially, in our own families, uh, of how they're spending their time. And when I convict you on that, or when I bring God's word to say, like, we need to honor God with our family, everyone's like, okay, that's cool. I I get that. But you know where it gets kind of rough and kind of gets a little awkward is when I start talking about serving. Like, within the margin, within your margin, like the time that you've sort of allotted, uh, and I'm going to go there, that there should be time allotted to serve God and through serving his people. And this is where, like, whoa. And I'm, I'm, I'm a Gen X person, so I'm not a millennial. And Gen X, we're all skeptical, okay? Just in case you didn't know that, we, have, we are sort of cynical. Uh, we kind of all have seen it all before. We've been hurt enough. We've been wounded enough. Uh, and so we always see the agenda behind whatever's being presented, and we're like, all right, what's, what's really going on? Peel it back. Peel it back. Oh, you just want me to do more for you. Like that's sort of how us Gen Xers are. And so if you're in your late 30s, early 40s, you sort of feel that way about church. Every time you come here, there's always sort of like that your guard's up. You're like, "Mm mm-hmm, heard that one before. Now, if you're a millennial, congratulations, you don't feel that way, which is pretty great. You're pretty like everything's good and positive, and we're going to change the world and make the world a better place. So I'm so grateful for you guys in your 20s. You have no skepticism yet. And so um, you're helping me overcome my own cynical heart. So thank you. All right, so, but for us Gen X people, when I talk about serving, there's this automatic wall that comes up and says, like, I've heard this before. You want something more from me. And you want me to go to financial peace? You want me involved in the community group? You want me to serve the church? You want me to serve the community? What else do you want from me? And it's like, ah. And what I want us to get to is a place where we're here to have a heart that God would want something for us, okay? God wants something for us through our service, not something from us. And speaking of service, um, uh, right this morning we have a the, like mud people are here. I don't know if you guys know. We had a Joe Patronus and Betsy Harper here at first service. I'm not sure if they're still here. Uh, and they're on the mud board, and we're so grateful for them. And we also have Janet Maxey, who's on the mud board. And then the, the incumbent Janet Maxey versus Chris Garriott, the aunt rising star in, in Bell's Branch politics. Okay, so that's, they're both here. So you guys wave your hands like you care. And if you guys want to talk to them, get their pamphlet, find out more information. These guys ser- are seeking to serve our community. And if you guys don't know anything about the Wells Branch Mud, we get to do church here at the pleasure of the Wells Branch Mud, which is really great. So thank you, Wells Branch Mud, for that. And the fun thing about um, the Wells Branch Mud Board, because I... Uh, I don't know if you guys aren't involved on like the Wells Branch Google group. There's a lot of nasty grams that go and tell the Wells Branch mud all the things they're doing wrong and how they need to be doing more for everybody. And I want to pay lower taxes, get more services. And I want more stoplights and um, my dog's lost and someone find it for me. I mean, like that is sort of like the, you know, that's a pericope of like your daily mail that you get from the mud or the Wells Branch Google group. But the thing is, they get a lot of emails that say all the stuff they're doing wrong, and very few times a thank you. So I want to just for real briefly, thank you, Wells Branch Mud, for all that you do uh, in serving. You can get back to all your emails of, like, uh, nasty grams uh, after service, because I'm sure there's plenty of them waiting. But for a moment, thank you. Uh, and, but what, here's the thing about serving is that because we, we sort of have this consumer mentality of our culture. The consumer mentality of our culture, and it's, and it's been birthed out of a, some really great things. Like uh, 50, 60, 70, 80 years ago, as our culture was really starting to do business, we learned that may, the customer is always right. It was a great motto that business people needed to um, share it so that they kind of put the customer first, which is great. The problem became when customers started expecting it, and so there was a demand that sort of creeped into the culture off a really great thing, which was like serve the customer. The customer says, oh, I deserve it. And so what happens is that sort of crept into the church. And so I, I'm going to show up, shut up, and pay up, but I want my religious goods and services the way I want them. And so that became a place where church sort of devolved a little bit to a place where I want to get what I want when I want it because I deserve it. And so I feel like there's what the, the tension that we're wrestling with is this thing where there's a place where we need to serve God out of a grateful heart but we run up against our own sinfulness, our own desires, and the culture that we live in. 
Um, and, there, and it's true, there's a lot of times where you don't get recognized for stuff that you do. Um, for example, this past week I had breakfast with uh, Carl Glotter, one of our young adults here. And uh, he's just gotten recently plugged in, and uh, he lives a street behind me. So it was really cool, you know, someone in Wells Branch, getting reached in Wells Branch, and they're at our church now. And uh, I said, well, what, Carl, what brought you to our church? He's like, well, I was at the gas station, and this random guy, Joey Perez, started striking up a, a conversation with me. He didn't know it was Joey at the time. And then Joey just point blank asked him, he goes, so how's your walk with God? And Carl's like, uh, well, I'm actually kind of looking for a church. He's like, well, right now there's a young adult service right over there. You know, they're in the gas station parking lot. That's where you should do your evangelism, I guess. And uh, right over there, they're having a young adult service right now. Why don't you come with me? So he goes, Carl goes, and he stands there. You know, he walks in awkwardly because he doesn't know anybody. And, you know, and it's just weird going to a new place. He's like, and then um, a couple guys started walking up to him and saying, hey, uh, my name's Kyle, my name's Matt, I want to get to know you, my, name, my name's Mark. And so all these guys came in and, and met with Carl at that moment and said, I want to get to know you. And then they invited him here Sunday morning. And then he came and he's like, and this is what he said to me, he's like, it's like I couldn't get away from you people. <laughs> like I left with like 10 friends and I didn't even, and everyone had my phone number and people wanted to hang out with me and that's never happened ever. And so, so thank you to people who serve, and you probably didn't know that the impact you had in Carl's life, but it was deeply impactful the way that you treated him because he said, i got to come back for that. I want more of that. Um, I also got a, a, a text this week uh, from Rene Gonzalez, who's one of our parents of our youth, and, and he said, um, hey, I just wanted you to know, uh, Chris, that um, my sixth grader is loving youth group. And what they said that one day they wanted to grow up to be a youth shepherd You know, when a parent writes that, what that says is you've impacted their kid enough that the kid's talking about the stuff that's going on in their soul and how it's impacting them. And so thank you so much to our youth shepherds who are pouring into uh, these kids in middle school, which, I mean, is life hard in middle school or what? In high school? I mean, that's, that's a hard row. And these guys are pouring in, and it's not like um, all the time all the parents are going, thank you, thank you, thank you. It's more like, why is my kid late? You know what I mean? Like that, those are the kind of the stuff that we sort of deal with. And what I want you to see is that there is people, and this, that's kind of the cool part of being the pastor, is like everyone tells me how great it is. Like, thank you. And they also tell me how cruddy it is too. But for the most part, it's been, been great. In fact, I got a card this week because uh, like today, like Shelly Knight handed me this card, and it was like a thank you for serving our church card. I was like, oh, this is so appropriate. I, I should have like cued you in on when you were supposed to do this last week, so I had this prepared. Um, but that doesn't happen very often, right? People in general aren't ready to just kind of tell you how great you're doing, and that's part of our culture. You get told you're doing great when you serve me well, and you give me something, and then I give you the tip. Okay. So, I want us to get to a place where we look at service not as another thing, but something that we include within the margin of our time because it's that valuable for our soul. And we're going to be in uh, Mark chapter 10. If you don't have a Bible, I want you to raise your hand in the air. Wave it like you do care, and a Bible will come to you. And if you don't have a Bible at all, this is our gift to you. I mean, huh? You got a free Bible today. And if you don't have a Bible at all, uh, if you don't have a Bible at all, it's your gift to you. But if you do have a Bible and a stack of them at home, uh, bring back the 10 that you borrowed. All right. And so we're going to be in Mark chapter 10, and uh, we're going to start at verse 35, and that's on page uh, 846. And uh, if you guys aren't familiar with this particular story, uh, Jesus is hanging out with the disciples, and James and John are uh, two guys, and they want leadership. They are ambitious guys, and they go get their mom. And now their mom happens to be Jesus' aunt. Her name's Salome. And they go to, they go to her, their mom, Salome, like, listen, mom, Jesus is about to make it big. I mean, he's grown in popularity, the miracles. I've seen some stuff. This guy isn't going to be a nobody for nothing. we got to get in on the front end of this thing. So go talk to him. Remember, you knew Jesus when he was like 12, 13, helping through the, you know, the weird, awkward relationships of being the son of God and you know, all that um, and dealing with teenage years. Like you helped him through that. I don't know. I just made that up. It probably didn't happen like that. But so they go to their mom. This part is true. They go to their mom and they go, listen, you got to go talk to Jesus for us. We need to get propped up with some power. All right, so they send Salome uh, 
Jesus' aunt to go and talk to Jesus about them getting in on the front end of some power. Right, listen to this. And, and Matthew tells the story of the mom coming in and talking to him. Mark leaves that part out because he's going to address James and John, who this is really coming from. So Mark chapter 10, starting at verse 35. Here's Jesus rolling with the disciples, and then he has this conversation with James and John. Uh, verse 35. Then James and John, the sons of Zebedee. Now, Zebedee means thunder. Like, so sons of thunder. These guys were bold, and they didn't mind making some noise. All right, So that's kind of their, their, their definitely bold dudes, and their actions presented that way. Then James and John, the sons of Zebedee, came to him, Jesus, and said, Teacher, we want you to do for us whatever we ask. Now, you've, now don't judge them, because you've done this. You've been like... Jesus, there's this guy, and he's supposed to love me, and he should be asking me to marry him really soon. I want you to do for me whatever I ask. I want carte blanche of how the wedding's going to go, and I want my family not really be involved too much, and I want this whole thing to kind of be a quick engagement, knock this thing out, and let's make it all happen. We've all done that. We've all had like moments uh, in our lives where we kind of ask Jesus for the carte blanche, for the girl, for the job, uh, for the guy, for, uh, you know, the relationship, for the promotion. We've all kind of gone that, Jesus, I just want you to do whatever I ask, and we've sort of relegated. I mean, we put Jesus in a bottle because he's our little genie, and the good news is it's not just our culture that's done that. That's something that people have been doing our entire lives. Even James and John in first century Jerusalem. And he goes, Jesus goes, well, what do you want me to do for you? And they said to him, permit one of us to sit at your right hand and the other at your left in your glory. Meaning we want to be number two and number three in the kingdom. Now, James is the older brother, so he gets number two just because birth order and they don't want to mess with that. And John gets to be number three and that's not so bad because the older brother and it works. But all the rest of these guys report to us is essentially... What they're saying. I mean, I want you to think about the boldness of that. And we're going to get more into that in a second. I mean, that is insane, right? These guys have been, these guys have given up their lives to follow Jesus, and then all of a sudden we got a hierarchy kind of follow, or hierarchy issue conflict coming up. Now look at this. But Jesus said to them, you don't know what you're asking. Are you able to drink the cup I drink or be baptized with the baptism I experience? And what he's talking about this, drink the cup that I drink, is Jesus about to go absorb the wrath of God. Right? In case you were, you know, you're new to church, Jesus takes on the wrath of God, and um, that's symbolized by a cup of wine. All right, so a cup of wine would be God or Him pouring out God's wrath the, onto Jesus, and He drinks it, absorbs the wrath of God. And so He's saying, "Are you going to share with me? Are you going to share in drinking this cup of wrath? And are you going to be baptized with the baptism I baptized?" And that's kind of the good part of like being Holy Spirit empowered to go do God's work. And they're like. We are able, meaning I'll do whatever it takes to get in charge. Whatever dues I got to pay, just put my, I want my guaranteed contract. I'm a number one draft pick. I want number one draft pick money. And then Jesus said to them, you will drink the cup I drink, and you will be baptized with the baptism I experience. But to sit at my right or at my left is not mine to give. It is for those for whom it's been prepared. Now, this next line is, uses some language that, you're probably not um, too familiar with because we don't use the word indignant very often. And when the ten heard it, the other, the other ten, the other ten disciples, so Peter and the gang, they began to get indignant or to be indignant at James and John. And just a brief definition of indignant, it's the angry version of I deserve. That's unfair. That should be my role, right? I mean, like, that, they can't take over that. Uh, and they're probably upset primarily because they didn't ask first. I mean, here's James and John. They sort of beat him to the punch. And everybody, I mean, they didn't, I mean these guys were looking for the Messiah, but they're, they're looking for the Messiah to be on the right side of things. And when he's got the miracles and he's got the power, they want to be on the banner. When the marketing poster comes out, they want to be, be with Jesus. They want to be right there. But really what they're saying is this, and this is why they're, they're angry. People become indignant. People become angry at unjust treatment. Why? With those who are seeking servants over friends. Now, I, I want to put this in about as simple as a language as possible because you may not realize that we do this, but we do this. Ready? Here, here, this is what it looks like. Remember, these guys were disciples. They'd all given up their businesses. That, uh, 
Andrew and Peter were fishermen. They left their boats on the beach, followed Jesus. James and John were fishermen, left their boats with their dad. They roll out. Uh, you had tax collectors. You guys had, you know, working guys, left their jobs to follow Jesus, left it all. They're following Jesus. They kind of gave it all. They're all unified in that. And then all of a sudden, two guys look at everybody else and said, I'm not going to be satisfied with our relationship until I'm your boss. Now think about that. I, mean, I won't be satisfied with our relationship until I am your boss. That is sad. That I'm going to throw away I'm going to even kill. Now, thankfully, the disciples matured after this. They weren't kind of stuck here. But they were willing to throw away a relationship for power because they wanted credit and they wanted honor. And it was about me as opposed to about the unity of the group as they're on a mission that was something greater than themselves. This is why in all church world, right, so I mean this is, Jesus in the small church, you know, the house church of 12, and they've got serious conflict. So if you think you've come to this church because we don't, you know, no one's going to fight and it's the perfect church and we're in a rec center so it can't be that bad because no one's fighting about color of the carpet. We'll fight about other things, I promise. In the first church, you've got people lording power over other people and they haven't even started yet. They've been hanging out with Jesus for a couple years now. And you'd think some of that would rub off at some point. And here they are. They say, like, Jesus, you and me are tight, but these other people, they're going to work for me. Now, I've seen this amongst pastors. I mean, like, of course, not our church. We're the perfect church. But I've seen it. (laughs) <laughs> where people say, I'm not going to be satisfied with our relationship until I'm your boss. And I, it breaks down. Now think about it this way. It not only does it break down a church, it breaks down a marriage. I'm not going to be satisfied with our relationship until I'm your boss. And you better respect my authority. And this is where we go. I'm not going to be satisfied until I'm your boss. And pe- that makes people angry. Um, I know that's like shocking. I mean, this is this is sort of like you know the guy that's in you know in high school that always called shotgun, all right, and in college, and then you go on like a four-hour road trip, and he'd be sitting there in the front seat, moving the seat back, messing with the people that are squeezed in like sardines. You guys know what I'm talking about? But it's 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 not too much greater degree. It's 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 using people to get what you want, to get the credit you need, the, the, the insecurity that you're feeling because I need someone to, to, to recognize me. I need the honor. I need the credit. I need someone to know that I'm doing something awesome. I deserve this place of power or this place of authority or this place of honor. This is why we gossip. And just in case you were wondering, we gossip. We talk about other people so that we can use them to step on them so that we make ourselves feel better. Somebody else goes, oh, that must be so hard for you. I can't believe you had to endure that. Or like uh, we, we, we talk about those people in certain ways so that we can feel better and we can, the functional savior of, ah, oh, at least I'm not that guy, is always what drives us. And that's why we use passive-aggressive comments and, you know, snarky remarks and those little one-liner jabs that we're not really sure what that was intended for, but we do it. Because there's this insecurity in us that we need to step on somebody so that we can feel better about ourselves. Because ultimately, in our hearts, in our heart of hearts, this is why serving is so hard. This is why we do it sometimes with complaining. This is why we do it with sometimes a little bit of angry heart. Is because we feel it's not fair. And I want somebody to freaking serve me. All right, let's move on. (laughs) Verse 42. And Jesus called them to him. So, the, you know, this is the first holy huddle. He's like, guys, 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 bring it in, bring it in. They're about to go to fisticuffs. Everyone's really annoyed. Like, Peter's like, you say, say it again. Say it again, you're going to be my boss. Say it again. And you've got, like, the frustration. You've got the anger. You've got all that sort of friction. And Jesus brings them all together. He's like, look, 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 listen. You know that those who are considered rulers of the Gentiles, Gentiles just being non-Christian, Christ-following people, godless people, Uh, those who have like no moralic value, you know that those who are considered rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them. 
and their great ones exercise authority over them. But it shall not be so among you. So Jesus called the disciples not to seek servants like the rest of the world. Now, I, I, the, I was really trying to come up with how to say this. And do you ever have like one of those nights where you, just, you took a nap during the middle of the day, that was a mistake, and then you're up all night? All right, so I was crafting this statement in between like 1 and 2 a.m. last night, so bear with me. Leaders who you respect, leaders who are um, visionary, and leaders who are ones whom you want to follow and are looking uh, for the best of the whole are the ones that want to take your problems on not give you more stuff to do. You with me? I'm going to try and say this again. So you know somebody is a great leader. When they go, give me your problems. How can I help you? Someone's a terrible leader. When they go, here's the problems I want you to go and fix. Fix my stuff. As, as leaders, and if this, is, this is like corporate world. This could be anywhere. This is, this is like for free across the board. This isn't just spiritual. All right? Although it is spiritual. When you have people that you're leading or um, in, in charge of, you're over, responsible for, and your words to them are like, do this thing, not how can I help you, how can I serve you, you are automatically in the category of bad leader person. Just, just FYI. If your first thought is, here's your list of stuff, not how can I serve you, you're in the cruddy leader cat, uh, category. Cruddy leader category, there we go. So it looks like, I want to be a leader, and remember, this kind of comes back to a Kennedy phrase, you know, ask not what your country can do for you, but what you can do for your country. That, that is sort of the mentality that we're wanting uh, to wrap our heads around, because Jesus says that Gentiles, the pagans, they're looking for more servants. They're more, looking for more people to do their bidding because they need some slaves to kind of do their thing. Get to work. And listen, I, I wish I could tell you that, like, you know, my life, of course, I was never like that because, you know, I'm... Very spiritual and a pastor. Um, uh, but let's just go back to high school for a second, okay? So high schoolers, where you at? Yeah. Uh, yay. All right. <laughs> so when, uh, when I was in high school, I ran for a National Honor Society president. Now, why do you run for National Honor Society president? Pad your resume. Great. So you want your resume to whatever you apply for colleges to be like National Honor Society president. Because no one's going to call down to the school and be like, so how effective a leader was he as president of the National Honor Society? They just, you just need something on your resume that says awesome. So um, I was going to run for National Honor Society president, and I, like, worked on my speech. Like, we had, like, one, it was, like, election day, and I was working on my speech, and, like, I was, like, I had the thing down. I practiced for hours and hours, like, you know, push back the darkness, somehow got in there. Um, you know, I'm kidding. So, but it was, you know, there's my, you know, the 17-year-old version of myself working on the National Honor Society speech. Uh, I get up, and I'm going against this blonde girl, Sarah, and I kill it, man. I have, like, people crying. I'm like, yeah. And then I won, all right? And you know what I did at, for National Honor Society after that? Nothing. I don't even think I, I, we didn't attend a meeting. We didn't do anything all year. Um, but we had like a, you know, in the, in the little bowl at the end, I had an asterisk by my name on graduation, National Honor Society President Chris Pleckenpole. What's up? <laughs> Used them. Used them all. And that, if, if that, you know, thankfully I've matured a little bit, little bit since then. But, like, if that is your heart, that I'm going to use these people to get something that I want, then what you're doing is you're looking for servants to serve you. You are just like the Gentiles, and I was just like the pagan people looking for more servants to forward my agenda. And my heart is that we wouldn't be like that. Our heart would be like uh, when it came to like parking spots that you know you go figure out how to park at like you know Shoreline and walk down here or something. I mean, like th my my heart is that we would be like spurring one another on in love and good deeds because we want to serve one another. When it comes to community events, it wouldn't be trying to like, all right, who's gonna come out this time? I've done it for fifty straight times. It would be like, how can I serve my community? When it comes to needing volunteers and children's ministry uh, partnering with us, when it comes to getting greeters, everyone's like, it's not like. Uh, or rather, how can I get involved and serve? Because it's not about the credit, it's about the unity. Remember the thing that Jesus talked about over and over and over again? They will know we are Christians by our love and the way that we are. They will know we are one. I want you to know that we are one just as my father and me are one. I want the people to see that you and me are one and the way that we interact I want you to see unity just coming off of us because we are on mission together for something far greater than ourselves. Let's not be like the rest of the world.
I mean, when we come in here, it should be like almost people fighting to be like, no, no, after you, no, no, after you, no, no, after you. Our marriage is, just, I mean, imagine your, what your marriage would look like if you said, no, no, wherever you want to do, sweetheart. You want that dress? Yeah, absolutely. You want to you, you do whatever you want to do? Yes, let's just make sure it's in our budget. <laughs> imagine how that would transform your heart if you looked at somebody, not who's going to do your bidding, because you want to be their boss, but rather somebody whom you wanted to serve. All right, last little bit. And because this last pit, I, I love this, because it, it gets to Jesus' heart. Not even Jesus does anything just for free. Jesus is going to get rewarded for all of his service, and I want you to see uh, this reward, because we, we understand working for something. Like, that's not part of our consumer culture is we work to get something. Look at this last couple of verse. Here's, here's Jesus talking. But whoever would be great among you must be your servant. So whoever's going to be the, the greatest eats last. That was common in the army. Like you get like the leftover potatoes or gratin, which nobody eats, and you get no meat uh, because you, all your soldiers go and give themselves like three helpings, and you're kind of stuck with the green beans and, and, and potatoes or gratin, which was always terrible. <laughs> the leaders eat last. The greatest ones eat last. But whoever be great among you must be your servant. Whoever be first among you must be slave of all. For even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and give his life as a ransom for many. Now, here's the question. Who is Jesus giving his life as a ransom to? Do you ever think about that? It's like, you know, the devil and him had a deal. It's like, all right. All right, you got all these people. Here it is. I'll die. You, you, we do a little switch off and um, I get the people. No, no, that's not who that's not who he gave his life to. You see, God is perfect. I don't know if you guys are tapped in that God is perfect, he's holy and he's just and he sent Jesus to die on the cross. Now Jesus, God the Father are one, but it's the Trinity and the only way that the, the, what happened when Jesus in the incarnation for Christmas what happened is that the Trinity took on humanity. And then Jesus lived a perfect life of serving others. And ultimately serving us by dying on the cross for our sins. But why? Because he is a just God and can't let sin be like, whatever. Like, look around the world. It's not like we live in like a happy candy land world where everyone's just like, you know, yay, racial tensions, that don't exist. Um, like, uh, culture wars aren't anything. That, I mean, there is a reality of darkness and murder and people wanting to get theirs outside of here and you've experienced the brokenness and you've been wounded and you've been hurt. And so Jesus died for that pain. And then part of the really crazy part, you've been a rebel yourself in contributing to the pain and hurt and heartache to some degree. And Jesus, being a just God, can't let that go unpunished. And so he dies on the cross for your sin because he's just to, to pay the ransom for you. But it is Jesus who is God because of his love for us. Because he designed us to worship him. And when we work together and we serve together in unity, it's like this glorious thing of beauty. Because the very thing that Jesus died for was that you would be one with him because of his great love for us. And so what Jesus gets for his coming not to be served but to serve is you. He gets his creation back. The only thing that Jesus lacked before the cross was you. There was a brokenness of relationship, and he dies on the cross to restore that. And if you would receive it, you could have eternal life. That is exciting. Now, that's why we serve, because our hearts are filled with this gratitude of what Jesus has done. I mean, we sing a lot of songs about blood and stuff, which if you're not a Christian here, you're like, hey, guys, easy on the blood. <laughs> Like, I didn't know, there's like some pagan cult, but where are the goats? You know, I mean, like, that's not it, right? The blood of Jesus, him dying on the cross, his blood that was shed represents he died uh, and endured separation from God. Hell, the only time that uh, Jesus doesn't call God Father in prayer is when he's on the cross saying, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Because the relationship is gone. The, the father-son relationship of eternity past is broken up, and there's that unbelievable sorrow, hurt, heartache, and pain that you felt yourself at some point in your life and he experienced it and he died and then he rose from the dead and gave life to all those who would receive it and listen that's why Jesus calls his disciples to be servants to the rest of the world and you know what starts you know where you can start with that serving Jesus himself 
Now, this is what's cool about Jesus. He said that the church is also known as the body of Christ. The church is the body of Christ. So you serve Jesus himself when you're holding somebody's screaming kid in, in the nursery. You serve Jesus himself when you give a single mom like an hour and a half to get exposed to God's word and like for a moment just have peace from the work, daycare, food, sleep, start all over again routine. You give somebody hope when you, you welcome them at the door and they're like, somebody care enough about me to say hello. You serve Jesus himself when you set this place up. I mean, look at this. This is a lot to set up. And if you think like, you know, like, the people that set up are our most faithful, talented people that work at like Fortune 500 companies, but they come here to set up and serve, and when they could probably do something way more awesome like in, in most people's minds, but they see the value of creating an environment for people like us who are broken and need a place to come and worship God because they see what God has done in their own lives and are hoping and praying, God, would you please do that in somebody else's life on a Sunday morning? And I'm not going to look for credit. I'm going to look for the unity to push this mission forward. Because of what Jesus has done for me. So my question for you this morning is, are you serving? Is there a place where you're serving? Are you plugged in here to serve the body of Christ? And listen, there is no, um, like, we have a need. There's deep needs, but... I don't want this to be a guilting, like, hey, they got needs at the church, so I gotta go serve it, and kind of like that angry heart thing. No, no, no. I want you to say, Jesus has transformed my life so much, I would be a fool not to give my heart and my life to the unity of this mission, because it's not about the credit I deserve, but rather the unity of showing off how beautiful God is and what he has done for me. In fact, we celebrate what Jesus has done for us very regularly. In fact, back in the olden days before uh, they had rec centers for churches, they used to have like, uh, the whole church was like a, set up around an altar. Like you'd have a big kneeler thing, all right, and you'd have like little cushiony things to come up and put your knees on, and the pastor or priest or whatever, they would come by, and they would go, and at, the whole point of the service was for communion. And you'd take bread and you'd break it. And the pastor would go, this is Christ's body broken for you, and then he'd break it up by saying, this is the body of Christ broken for you, Christ's body for you, body of Christ for you, and it was, Awesome. And what it was to remind you is that when you took the bread, you remember Jesus' body being broken upon that cross. And then you'd have another little communion helper person with the wine. And they would take the wine around, and every person would drink of it. And the, and the pastor would say, this is, Christ, this is the blood of Christ shed for you. Christ's blood shed for you. Blood of Christ shed for you. And you would remember that Jesus shed his blood on the cross for you. For all the brokenness, for all the sin, for all the darkness. And the whole thing was to come remember this. That's why people gathered. That was the primary purpose of, of Christians gathering. And I don't want us to forget that. So this morning, if you're not a Christian here today, don't take communion. That's sort of like a weird thing. It's like, it's weird. But if Jesus died on the cross for you and you received it, you come here and you take communion, even if it's for the very first time. If you are a Christian here, but there's some hang up in your heart and you're like, ah, I got issues. I, I'm, I'm still needing the credit. I'm, I'm, you know, I don't want to really admit it, say it out loud, but I'm saying, Jesus, I want you to give me a carte blanche check uh, to do whatever I want you to do. And all these people here at the church are my servants. If you've got that sort of heart, I want you to repent of that. I want you to sit and confess that to God. And then I want you to come forward and, and I want you to say, oh yeah, the reason why I serve, the reason why I do everything I do, the reason why I include serving God's people, serving the rest of the world in my margin is because of what he's done for me. And I want that to happen this morning. Would you guys pray with me? Father, I'm so grateful that there are people here who don't know you. And I'm praying that you would reach into their soul and that something would speak to their heart and they would say, I want something more. And God, when we, with our whole agenda of reaching people, that people might think we're crazy for the stuff we believe, but they see the way we love and the way that we're unified in purpose and service. And Father, I'm praying 
that somebody would see that and say, I want Jesus. And I believe that his blood shed on the cross for all my sins and he endured hell for me. And I don't deserve it, but he saved me and I accept it. And somebody would take communion for the first time. And God, for the rest of us who are walking in your truth, who are continually trying to put aside the needs of the flesh to to serve you wholeheartedly with a pure heart, would you help us to rest for a moment before we come forward, take communion and experience just for a moment the symbolic truth and remember that day when you saved us in spite of us. We love you, Jesus. It's all for your glory. Amen. Imagine just for a second if the person sitting next to you was thinking, how can I serve you? What would happen to the way that you view church? Instead of thinking, what can I go do for myself? How can I get out of here in the parking lot the fastest? How can I kind of beat somebody out of here so I can get to Luby's or wherever you're going? Imagine what happened if we kind of thought of others in terms of people that we serve as opposed to another person to get what I want. What if you treated your family that way? What if you treated Christ's body, the church that way? What if we treated the world that way? It would change everything. The people would say, you guys are crazy, but I can't deny you love. And they would go on to be a part of something like that. Would you receive the benediction? Go. And be a people who go out into the world, not to find more servants to advance your own cause, but go and be a people so committed to unity, not to finding more people to be boss over. Go and be committed to unity to serve alongside one another as we go and push back the darkness and reach people the life changing around Jesus Christ. Go and have an awesome week of worship. You're dismissed.